Hello, my name is Corey, and I am the Bariatric Coordinator at Cuyuna Regional Medical Center. And I'm here today to talk to you about our bariatric weight loss surgery program. So today we're going to kind of talk about what our program is, what, um, what all entails if it's something that you want to consider. We'll talk about insurance requirements. We'll also have the dietitian speak. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the psychology requirements as well as have Dr. Severson, one of our bariatric surgeons, speak as well about obesity as a, as a disease and the surgical options themselves. So um, CRMC is our hospital, which stands for Cuyuna Regional Medical Center, and our surgery department is, um, we call it MIMIS, which stands for the Minnesota Institute of Minimally Invasive Surgery. And so all of our surgeries done here are done typically in the minimally invasive technique, and we've been doing it that way for over 28 years. Um, as you'll see here, most operations are performed that way, including our robotic surgeries, bariatric and foregut surgeries, general surgeries, therapeutic endoscopy, gynecologic surgeries, urologic surgeries, orthopedics, and ophthalmology. Um, here is a photo of our entrance, which has just recently been remodeled, so it looks beautiful. Um, this is what you will see at our main campus in Crosby when you come to see um, the dietitian or the surgeon or myself as you prepare for surgery. Our center of um, bariatric center is considered a center of excellence, which is, means it's accredited by all these different um, distinction centers. So the MBSA QIP, which is a national accreditation center that is um, one that we use the data or we compare ourselves to other centers ar around the country to make sure that we're doing the most up-to-date technologies, the most up-to-date education. Um, that is an accreditation we need to re renew every three years. Blue's Distinction Center, um, you'll see that we are a center of excellence for robotics, and we just recently received the Outstanding Patient Experience Award, which we're pretty excited about. Specifically for bariatric surgery here at CRMC, we've been doing it for over 18 years, and we've done more than 2,200 laparoscopic operations, which include gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, sleeve gastrectomy and some revisional surgeries. We have a very low complication rate, and our average weight loss is roughly 100 pounds. So here is the bariatric team. You'll see myself. I'm the coordinator for the program. Um, Leah Carlson is also one of our coordinators. She primarily works with our reflux patients. However, sometimes she's able to kind of help out in the reflux department. And sometimes those two options might be kind of married, if you want to call it that. Um, a patient may come in because their reflux is bad and then end up being referred to the bariatric program. So we work really close together. Um, Gina is our dietitian, and you'll, you'll see her later. She will talk to you about um, her part and what the dietitian plays in, in preparing for bariatric surgery. Um, Jeanette Grew, she is our um, clinical nurse reviewer. She's the one that takes all that data and reports to all those um, accrediting bodies for us. Um, Dr. Kristen Fearon is a psychologist that we work with here at CRMC. Um, anybody that sees or that participates in our program and works towards bariatric surgery must see a psychologist. So she is the one we have on staff here at CRMC. We do work with other ones um, off-site as well if that's more convenient for you. Melissa Deardahl is one of our um, nurse practitioners as well as Stacy Roslansky and Elizabeth Jenkins. So program requirements and what this means is that just simply means that if you pursue bariatric surgery with me or with us, you will have to um, do these insurance require or these program requirements, not only for the insurance coverage, but as well as so we want to make sure that you're understanding what this lifestyle different changes are. So you will view a weight loss seminar, which is what this is. Um, we will have to maintain or obtain your medical records for the past two years, and that's something I can do for you. Um, number three is kind of the, the bulk of the program, and that's where you have to complete required um, certain appointments with different providers. So you'll work with the dietitian to work on nutritional therapy. You'll work with a physical therapist or exercise specialist. Um, manometry testing, that is something that we do more of a case-by-case -case basis, so not everybody's going to have to do that. It's going to look more about your history. Psychology evaluation, again, something that everyone that goes through this program has to do. We do an upper GI endoscopy or um, an EGD. That's where um, the surgeon himself will take a camera and look at your stomach from the inside because we want to make sure that the stomach is healthy prior to surgery. You will meet with a pharmacist to go over medications, stuff that you're on currently and stuff that you might be on after surgery so that we have a good understanding of 
what we need to watch and monitor as medications change. And of course, you'll have a consultation with one of the surgeons. Um, obtain insurance approval. So this is something that we that I will do for you as well. It's required. It's called a prior authorization. So to have insurance cover this surgery, we need to get, obtain that prior authorization, or basically ask them to pay for it. Um, this is a surgery that's considered elective that we are proving to the insurance company that it's medically necessary. So a prior authorization is how we do that. Um, the dietitian will start you on a pre-surgical diet when that's appropriate. Um, so that has to be completed prior to surgery. Once we have that approval or that prior authorization, that's when we will choose and schedule a surgery date. And then number seven, which is just as important probably as all the rest, is your surgical follow-up. And that's what we would have you see us after surgery. So we want to make sure that you're committed to follow-up afterwards because we want to make sure that the surgery worked well and that you're doing good after surgery. So you'll have a minimum of five visits the first year and then just annually after that. So psychology requirements, like I said earlier, that psychology is a requirement not only for the insurance but for our program. So patients may schedule their own psychology appointment with a practitioner that's trained specifically in bariatric preparation. Um, sometimes people will ask me, I already see a psychologist, can I just use that as my psychology evaluation? And sometimes that is appropriate, sometimes we might require that you see somebody that's trained specifically in preparing for a surgery like this. Um, general insurance requirements, so like I said, most insurances do cover this procedure, but they do require some um, guidelines that you have to meet prior. And what those guidelines are is the first thing they're going to look at is your BMI or your body mass index. If your BMI is 40 or greater, most insurances will say that's reason enough to cover the surgery, you would meet the criteria. If your BMI is between 35 and 40, again, most insurances will say yes, this is good criteria, it is coverable. However, we do need to see some documented proof from a medical provider that you have a disease process that's related to your obesity or what we call a comorbid condition. And some examples of those would be type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, um, degenerative joint disease, reflux, high cholesterol, those kind of things. Now every insurance carrier is a little bit different on what their comorbidities are, so that's something that we would look individually at in e each case scenario. This is just simply a chart of a BMI table, so you can kind of get an idea of where you're at BMI-wise. On the left you'll see your height, and on the top you'll see weight. So you just want to take your height and your weight and kind of come together, and that's approximately where your BMI is. I would say this chart is not 100% accurate. We will take your BMI, your height and weight to get your accurate BMI at your first initial visit. All right, so some commonly asked questions and helpful hints. I would say that um, you're definitely your own best advocate when it comes to your insurance. So a lot of things, a lot of times people ask me, well, how do, how do I know if my insurance covers this? I guess my best advice is going to be just call and ask. Um, you can call the customer service number on the back of your card and just say, you know, hey, I'm interested in bariatric surgery and I want to know if that's a covered benefit. Um, they'll tell you. Um, never assume anything. We just want to always ask. And that's something I will call before we start individually on each individual person just to make sure we have coverage. Um, most insurance companies cover weight loss surgery but not all, sometimes it is listed as an exclusion, so we wanna make sure we know that before completing the whole program. Um, keep current on what your policy states. I would say um, always know when your renewal period is and try to keep in mind that renewal period always is not the first of the year. It's not always the first of the year. How did I say that wrong? Your renewal period is not always the first of the year. Um, sometimes it renews in March or it can be at the first of any month. Another question I get is how long does it take to prepare for surgery? And I would say truthfully that really varies. Um, it varies on two things. One, what your insurance carrier states as the criteria. And what I mean by that is some insurance carriers require that you um, work with the dietitian for six consecutive months. Some insurance policies just require you to do three months. 
Some don't have a timeline, they just will simply say work with a dietitian. So we'll look at that, so we have that idea as a guideline. The second way we determine how long it takes to prepare is how you individually progress through the program. So as you'll hear from the dietitian, um, you will work closely with her to determine or to set and achieve lifestyle goals. So once we set those, we need to achieve them. So we'll work through that in the timeline as well. Approval process, so after completing all those requirements, all those appointments that we talked about earlier, um, that's when we will send a request to your insurance company and that's that prior authorization. Once your insurance company has that prior authorization, legally it can take up to 30 business days for them to answer us or to give us an answer on that. Um, I would say, honestly, it doesn't seem to take that long. From my experience, I usually see an answer once we submit it within two weeks. So to get started, there's two things that I would need from, from you, and it would be um, the intake packet completed to the best you can, um, and then we need to get your records here for the past two years. And both of the things, once you sign the release of information sheet, I can obtain the records for you. But the intake packet is important because it gives us a brief picture of who you are now, kind of a little bit of your history, as well as appropriate signatures so that I can call insurance on your behalf and or open and start a chart for you. Once we receive that information, we will give you a call to set up your first initial appointments. And then I'm gonna let Gina talk a little bit about the nutrition therapy portion. Gina is our bariatric dietitian. Uh, hi, my name is Gina. I am the registered dietitian with the bariatric program. Um, today we're gonna talk about nutrition therapy and how it's involved in preparation for bariatric surgery. It's a really large part about with prep preparation for bariatric surgery because um, you learn a lot about how, about how to fuel your body for surgery and how to care for your body after surgery. At our meetings, we discuss a lot about pouch management and eating behaviors. Uh, we talk about where your eating behaviors are now, where they need to be before surgery, and where they should be after surgery to maintain or care for your pouch or your new stomach. Um, we also talk a lot about supplementation, such as vitamins or protein shakes, and how to use them properly, which ones to look for, and um, if you need them or not. A big focus of ours is setting and achieving lifestyle goals, um, whether that be you, for you to improve your health or your mobility. We find out where you want to be and then figure out how to get there step by step, um, month, by, month by month. We, I meet with you on a monthly basis and we kind of take it one step at a time and go at your own pace. When we feel like you're ready for surgery, when you're nutritionally ready, um, when you have mastered all the guidelines and feel like you um, are ready for this, we move you on to what we call the pre-surgery diet. Um, and this is a low carb diet in preparation um, for surgery. Within the week of your surgery, we will meet again. We'll talk about diet progression after surgery. Um, this involves talking about the different stages you'll go through as you move from a liquid diet back to a soft food and regular diet. The, no matter which surgery you choose, whether that be the gastric bypass or the sleeve, you will have the same guidelines or preparation um, leading up to surgery. The changes that you make before the program and the lifestyle habits that we work on will be things that you'll continue lifelong. They are not a short-term diet that you just do before the surgery. Um, these are things we we'll want you to continue for the rest of your life to care for your pouch and to maintain the success you've had after surgery. Keeping a food journal is required for the program. It's not only a necessary tool for me, but for you to recognize your eating patterns before um, and know where you need to improve or where you already do well. Um, and it helps us kind of figure out month by month what your nutrition looks like. You will follow up with me after surgery. It's really important that you do so just because we want to make sure that you're getting through your diet progression appropriately, that you're doing well with your diet progression, and that you are getting all the nutrients that you need. Lastly, it's important that you remember that we're making all these changes so that you can reach your weight loss goals and improve your overall quality of life. Now Corey will talk briefly about the psychology involved with bariatric surgery. So now we'll talk a little bit about the reason why psychology is important as we prepare for a bariatric surgery. So why we talk about psychology and why we have you meet you with the psychologist prior to bariatric surgery is because we want to help diagnose and or prevent any post-surgical non-physical complications that may occur. So that means after surgery, not your body, right? So grieving over the loss of enjoyment provided by eating, that's something that the diet, or I'm sorry, the psychologist is going to talk with you about. Cross addictions, depression, anxiety, disrupted relationships, 
body image distortion, self-image, those are all things that may come up when you're working with a dietitian that you're not even aware they're there. None of these are reasons that you would not qualify for a bariatric procedure. They're just things we want to know about on the front end so we can help prepare non or prevent some complications after surgery. So before I hand it over, or before Dr. Severson talks, um, I just want to say quickly, being mindful as you prepare for surgery or work through this program and being honest both with yourself and with us as a team, we'll be able to get you through it and get you to surgery and onto a healthier lifestyle. Thank you. I'd like to speak about the causes for why we're obese. Basically, between genetics, behavior, and environment, uh, this, this is the reason why people are obese. Now, we know that genetics has a large role to play. If you've got ancestors that are obese, you have a much greater chance of being obese yourself because you may have inherited those genes. Uh, a little bit of bad luck in that case. Uh, the environment is very important. We know that the environment here in the United States today, which we'll discuss in a bit, is very much different than the environment 100 years ago. We also know that behavioral changes are dramatically important because if we uh, settle into behaviors of uh, bad eating, basically, uh, that is going to affect our chances of uh, becoming obese. So it's a balance between these, and it's a little bit different for every person. Uh, in uh, U.S. adults, uh, decade by decade, starting back in 1990. Now, if you look back to 1980 and before, all of America had less than 10% of people who suffered from morbid obesity. But if you take a look at what happened during the 1980s, we're gonna start with the 1990 uh, picture of the United States of America. And we can look at those states which are a light blue. Those were the states at that time which were less than 10% of the public uh, suffered from obesity. You can see that the states there were darker blue, which is, uh, uh, 15, excuse me, 10 to 14 percent, uh, it, it was increasing. Now, now we're going to skip ahead to a decade, to the year 2000. There you can see a whole new color is introduced, and only one state in the entire union, Colorado, still having a somewhat normal amount of people with obesity. And you look at all of those southern states across the southern Sun Belt uh, had, uh, were now 20 percent or more. And then you skip ahead another decade to 2010, and it's unbelievable. There are no states with any color of blue whatsoever. Uh, the entire country is now at least 20%. And you have new colors that are introduced now greater than 30% across the southern part of the country. Just an absolutely dramatic increase in obesity in our country. Now, if you take a look at 2019, this is the most recent data that we have from the CDC, you'll see that this trend has not improved. In fact, it's getting worse year by year. If you take a look again, Colorado, uh, being the thinnest state in our, in our nation, uh, is a green color, 20 to 25%. And you look at those southern states, and it's now greater than 35% in, in many of our states. Now, if you take a peek at these maps, what this shows is the relationship in the upper uh, level maps compared to those in the lower level maps where obesity is progressing, uh, going from left to right. And then diabetes, if you look at the colors, just look at the colors and look up and down, you'll see that diabetes is quickly and rapidly following the map distribution for obesity. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us that diabetes is a direct result of obesity. And in fact, type two diabetes, which is now literally epidemic in our country, uh, is a result of the obesity epidemic. Now these are the lists of comorbidities. You're gonna hear the word comorbidities a lot if you start studying about obesity and you get involved with options for treating it. On the left column, you'll see the type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, 
obstructive sleep apnea, arthritis, and heart disease are common comorbidities caused by a person becoming morbidly obese. Those are the ones on the left that are the most important. And if, particularly if you're interested in pursuing perhaps a, uh, a surgical option for treatment, you're gonna need to have uh, some of these types of comorbidities if your body mass index is between 35 and 40. If your body mass index is greater than 40, the risk for serious disease in the future and early death is so significant that you don't even need to have any comorbidities. Usually an insurance company that covers bariatric surgery, for example, will pay for it. Now, if you look at the list of comorbidities on the right side of your screen, you'll see that there's a lot more problems that are associated with obesity. And this is just a partial list. Uh, and you can look down through that list. Many people who suffer from these things, they may not be uh, due to obesity, but obesity, if you have it long enough, can lead to all of the problems you see on that list. What about the risk of dying uh, due to obesity? Now this is a, a study that shows uh, the risk according to the body mass index. So if you look at the lowest level on the graph, you'll see that the lowest risk of dying are between a BMI, body mass index, of 18 and 25. Very little difference there, that's the lowest risk for death. Once a person starts to get obese, you can see it goes up a little bit as the body mass index gets between 27.5 and 30, and then more between 30 and 35. But look how fast it starts to go up, the risk of death. Uh, once you get to the body mass index of 35, and then finally on the far right, uh, uh, the body mass index of 40 to 50. Now we don't even have the body mass index uh, on that particular chart for 50 to 60 or, or greater than 60, but you can imagine it goes up logarithmically and the risk of death is very high. We basically tell you that if your body mass index is greater than 40, in other words, morbid obesity, it on the average, it will reduce your life expectancy by 10 years. Now the next thing we want to talk about is the bariatric surgical options. So we'll go on to discuss, first of all, the medical non-operative treatments. First, how good is diet and exercise? Because look, everybody's tried that. Nobody's going to talk about surgery until you've tried diet and exercise. Let's take a look at this 2005 very important study from the International Journal of Obesity. This is where the overweight and obese populations were specifically studied. And what it showed that was the average weight loss with diet alone was about 10%. So in other words, if you're 100 pounds overweight, you lost 10 pounds with diet alone. If you added exercise to the diet, it did increase the weight loss to 13%. So that would be 13 pounds if you needed to lose 100. Uh, that's not really great. So, you know, why don't we add some medications? Maybe if we took some pills along with diet and exercise, how much more would that help us achieve our goal? Well, this is a list, a partial list of the medications that have been used for weight loss. Uh, Phentermine uh, lost an average of nine pounds after taking the drug for six months. Diethylpropion. Uh, six pounds after six months. Orlistat, six pounds after a full year of medicine. Cybutramine, uh, eight pounds after a year. Uh, then uh, the FEN-FEN trial, which has now been many years since, uh, since it was pulled from the market, but uh, after three, four years of study, the average weight loss achieved through intense diet, exercise, and medications was only three pounds on the average. Uh, that's kind of sad because I know that most people can probably lose three pounds in a weekend if they really tried. What this is telling us is that it's not very effective. So the bottom line is 98% of patients who undergo non-operative weight loss are going to regain the weight, meaning only 2% are successful long term in terms of keeping the weight off. So the key to weight loss really is not how much you can lose with a particular diet, it's can you sustain that weight loss? 
And we'd like to quote the 1991 Consensus Conference on Obesity uh, that was also repeated, by the way, um, 20 years later, and they said, said exactly the same thing. Quotes, surgical treatment is medically necessary because it is the only proven method of achieving long-term weight control for the morbidly obese. Let me repeat that. I'm gonna just go back. Surgical treatment is medically necessary because it is the only proven method of achieving long-term weight control. All right. So what, what can we do to improve all those comorbidities by having bariatric surgery? Well, the Journal of the American Medical Association back in 2004 uh, published a very important article showing the improvements in multiple conditions. First, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes was eliminated in 77% of the patients who had bariatric surgery and improved in 86%. High blood pressure, which is hypertension, was eliminated in 62% and improved in 79%. High cholesterol was reduced in more than 70% of patients. And obstructive sleep apnea was eliminated in 86% of patients. So who makes a good candidate for surgery? Well, you have to meet the BMI requirements that we discussed earlier. You have to have a minimum age of 18 uh, to be able to have it because if you're less than 18 and you're in the so-called pediatric group, uh, that is more of a family problem or family disease and more than that particular patient needs to be treated. So it's a special category. Doesn't mean that they can't have it done, but it doesn't fit into the standard criteria for approval. Uh, you have to be well informed, and by simply listening today, that's going to help you to get informed. You have to be motivated. That means you have to go through the program, and the program itself uh, requires motivation because it actually takes a number of visits to a number of professionals on our team, and, uh, and you have to be an acceptable operative risk, which means that your doctor has to approve of your ability to be able to have surgery and uh, have a general anesthetic. In addition, our team needs to be confident that you'll be able to participate in long-term follow-up. So who's not a candidate for bariatric surgery? Uh, I can't stress this point enough. If you're unable, after all the training and learning in the initial part of our program, to limit the eating to three times a day, you should not have surgery. This surgery, no matter what type you select, are all designed to be able to be successful with three meals a day. If a person eats more than three meals a day, in other words, snacking, grazing, then there's no limit to the amount of calories that could be taken in in a 24-hour period, and patients can beat any surgery out there. So the most critical and important factor is our we able to only eat three meals a day after the procedure is completed. Untreated major depression or psychosis doesn't mean that you can't have patients who have major mental illness. They can, they have to be treated and it has to be under control. Binge eating disorders, uh, they need to be treated as well and that problem has to be solved. We should not go ahead with surgery until the, these problems are under control. Drug and alcohol abuse, uh, we, along with most other level one programs in the United States, require a full year of sobriety uh, in order to be able to proceed with a program. If a person has a severe cardiac problem uh, and that prohibits us from getting general anesthesia or major surgery, we can't do it. Uh, severe bleeding disorders are frequently, um, uh, it's not that we can't do a person with a bleeding disorder, but that can create problems with a big surgery. So we may uh, advise against it. Uh, finally, inability to comply with what the nutritionist is requiring for success. All right. Now, we want to talk about, in bariatric surgery, two different surgical options. There have been more out there which are not currently discussed. For example, the lap band was very popular for a while. Our center did do many of those. Uh, before that, other types of procedures like vertical banded gastroplasty, et cetera. 
All of those other procedures are now not mainstream and are not accepted in most centers. There is an operation called duodenal switch, which we do not offer at the Minnesota Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery. Uh, our two procedures are going to be either the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or the sleeve gastrectomy. All of these are performed laparoscopically with minimally invasive techniques, which we'll show you in a bit. The mechanism of action for these two types of procedures is a little bit different. With the sleeve gastrectomy on the right, we're basically removing uh, most of the body of the stomach, creating a small uh, skinny stomach tube, which is not a whole lot bigger than our esophagus swallowing tube, and therefore it can't expand, and therefore you can't eat a large meal. Uh, that is a purely restrictive operation. Uh, the GI tract remains intact. Uh, it does reduce hunger dramatically, and uh, uh, it is a mainstream operation, which is now the most popular operation in the United States. Uh, the time-proven Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, again, both performed laparoscopically, um, is not only restrictive because of the narrow tube, but it's also malabsorptive. In other words, we're using part of the small intestine uh, to create a bypass around the stomach and you don't digest in the Y. And if you look at that picture in the upper left of the Roux and Y gastric bypass, part of the uh, intestine that is excluded by a stapler, you can see the stomach is disconnected uh, from the esophagus. Uh, the gastric juices, the digestive juices flow down from the stomach through the, the one limb and then the food flows through the other limb. Digestion does not take place until the common channel occurs where both of the tubes, like two rivers joining into one, uh, once you become into the common channel, then the digestion takes place. That results in, a, in more weight loss than the sleeve gastrectomy. It's also known for having a fantastic uh, effect on diabetes. Many diabetics are cured with the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy can be effective in some diabetics, but not as effective as the bypass. Here at CRMC, we still do about three-fourths of our procedures are bypass. And the reason for that is not because we don't like the sleeve, it's because we are a revisional center and our bariatric surgeons are performing operations on people who have had either failures in the past or have special circumstances. And because of that, we do a lot of bypasses, which is the eventual uh, operation of choice for a failed sleeve or a failed lap band or any of the other previous operations that have failed. Um, the other thing is uh, with this, if you'll take a look with the bypass, this is a picture on the right. And uh, you can see that the stomach itself is completely separated from the esophagus and the small intestinal food limb. What, that, what happens with that is it's impossible to have a lot of problems with reflux. And a lot of patients who suffer from obesity do suffer from uh, reflux. And this operation is curative for the reflux. Now this has been the most common and the most successful of all procedures. It's time honored. In other words, it's been out for about 60 uh, to 70 years. And, uh, and so it's been perfected, so to speak. The small stomach pouch restricts the, flu the food intake and reduces the amount of food and calories that a person can consume. We expect to have anywhere between 60 and 90% of the excess weight loss after a one to two year period. The average is about 70%, which means if you were 100 pounds overweight, you would lose 70 of those uh, 100 pounds on the average. So you can see by the Y-shaped small intestine that the food is passed uh, below the esophagus through the food limb and then joins with the digestive juices in the biliary limb and then uh, digestion takes place below that. There's rapid improvement of the resolution of comorbidities with this particular procedure, particularly diabetes. Many of our diabetics go home uh, within one or two days and they're already off of all of their diabetic medications. Insulin-dependent diabetics go home without insulin. 
So uh, this procedure is considered irreversible, although it can be reversed, it's difficult, and it should be uh, considered uh, for people who are planning to not be morbidly obese uh, again for the rest of their life. Let's go ahead and watch an actual cartoon video of how the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass is performed laparoscopically. So the sleeve gastrectomy, this is now the most common type of bariatric operation that's performed in the United States. It's a purely restrictive procedure and the stomach is reduced to about 25% of its capacity. Uh, the um, excess weight loss that's achieved is less than a laparoscopic gastric bypass, but not by much. Uh, about 65%, which is only about 5 uh, to 10% less than a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And for that reason, it, it remains popular. Uh, because it's simpler, the intestinal tract remains completely intact. There's no rearranging of intestines. Uh, the uh, surgeon removes a large portion of the stomach along the outside or greater curvature, and the staple line is protected uh, in order to prevent leaks and this procedure is considered also an irreversible procedure because the, the stomach that is detached is removed from the body. Now let's take a look at a video of the sleeve gastrectomy and how that's performed.
So what should I expect after I've selected my surgery and my surgeon has performed the operation? Our hospital stays are usually one day. Uh, they can be two days after either operation, the bypass or the sleeve. The length of stay is roughly the same. We uh, recommend that you don't do any heavy lifting for two weeks. We provide a diet which you will uh, practice ahead of time and our bariatric uh, nutritionist will uh, specifically teach you exactly what you should be drinking and then finally eating after your procedure. We are going to recommend very early that you begin daily exercise. Vitamins are a very important part of your nutritional support for the rest of your life and medications will be evaluated prior to the surgery by our pharmacy staff and you will be asked to either eliminate uh, certain medications. For example, if you're diabetic, you're going to have a significant alteration of your uh, medications in the hospital before you actually leave for home. Other medications you may need to reduce because you're going to be losing weight rapidly. Complications. Uh, this slide talks about the early post-operative complications as well as the late ones. If we look at the left side where the early post-operative complications are, these are actually common to all surgical procedures. For example, bleeding and infection. Probably what's most worrisome is a person getting a leak. Because we're arranging the plumbing of the human body, leaks can occur when pipes are rearranged. And these type of leaks can be serious when they occur. And they usually happen once a person's already at home. So it's very important that if a person doesn't feel well any time in the first two weeks after the surgery, that they, uh, that they report back to their doctor, back to our program, to be able to guide you. And you have to seek early attention if there's any sign of a sickness. Fortunately, leaks nowadays can be dealt with successfully through endoscopic techniques where we can put stents in to block the leak. This has made a dramatic difference in how people can recover from these complications. Uh, nausea and vomiting can occur after surgery and is a little more common with the sleeve gastrectomy than with the bypass. But common to all bariatric operations is dehydration. Dehydration is the most common cause for people to be readmitted to a hospital during the first month after surgery. For that reason, our nutritionist is going to be instructing you in sipping on liquids and drinking your water literally almost all day because you can't slug down a big glass of water quickly like you could before the surgery. You have to sip away. It's very important to prevent dehydration and this will be our, our most uh, focused objective for you after the procedure. Blood clots can occur with any operation it's very rare in our program because our patients are up and walking very quickly afterwards. We use no catheters, no cat Foley catheters, urinary bladder catheters. We don't use any nasal gastric tubes. We don't use any drains in the abdomen. And so you're completely free and feel almost normal right away, which allows you to get up and walk around. That's going to go a long way to preventing blood clots. But that being said, we will provide very powerful blood thinners that you'll take before the surgery and while you're in the hospital to prevent blood clots. The um, heart problems, well, we really can't predict that too well uh, if you have heart disease, but you will be checked by your doctor for heart disease prior to the procedure. Stomach uh, and intestinal ulcers, they really don't occur right away. Ulcers are more of a intermediate type of uh, complication or a late complication. So if we take a look over at the uh, right side, uh, with the gastric bypass, uh, we can see ulcers right at the area where the stomach pouch is connected to the small intestine. We can also have small bowel obstruction. Now that's rare these days, the way uh, your bypass is constructed, but it can happen. And if there's any, of it, any time in your life afterwards where there's abdominal pain and vomiting, that needs to be evaluated very quickly and it needs to be evaluated by a bariatric surgeon. The other thing that can happen after a bypass procedure or even a sleeve gastrectomy is uh, stricturing or stenosis. 
Uh, that is when the connections that we create with a stapler uh, actually tighten down in the first few months. Very commonly this will happen about four to eight weeks after the surgery and the patient will not be able to pass food as they did before. Uh, this will be necessary to check this out with a repeat endoscopy should this occur. It is very easily treated, however, with a balloon dilation. And finally, vitamin deficiencies. It's so important that you follow the instructions for vitamin supplements. These will be taught to you by our nutritionist ahead of time. This is something you can never stop for the rest of your life. You'll always have to take a multivitamin. We will always have a ten tendency to develop iron deficiency and B12 deficiency and also vitamin D deficiency. Now, if you live in Minnesota, you can get a vitamin D deficiency by simply being a Minnesotan and not being in the sun. Uh, and this will be checked prior to ever having surgery to see if your levels are good. You will need supplementary vitamin D for the rest of your life. Uh, other types of deficiencies are quite rare and usually just by taking a general multivitamin uh, the, all the other types of deficiencies are prevented. Let's talk for a moment about the safety of bariatric surgery. Certainly most people perceive that this is a big, dangerous operation. Well, let's take a look. Maybe it's not so dangerous as you might think. This is a, a chart, or a graph I should say, of 30-day mortality rates. In other words, how commonly does someone actually die of a procedure? And you'll look at some of the big operations performed in the United States like aneurysms and heart surgeries and brain surgeries and a removal of the human esophagus, et cetera. But you'll notice on this graph that there's two uh, operations where it's so low it's almost zero. And that's hip replacements and bariatric surgery is the final one on your right, very, very low. If we take a look at the neck on, in yellow, you'll see that underneath. The combined mortality rate for bariatric surgery is well less than that of a hip replacement. It's 0.08%. So in other words, it's very safe. If we take a look at this study, this is a great study uh, where uh, that was performed in Canada, where they took uh, five-year death rates in patients with weight loss uh, patients versus people who didn't have uh, their, their surgery performed. Now, that's the column on the right. That's called the control group. These people chose either not to have surgery and try to lose weight by diet and exercise, or their insurance company didn't pay for it and they couldn't get it. The other group on the left shows the mortality rate for those people who had bariatric surgery. As you can see, over five years, there was a dramatic difference between those who lived without surgery and those who had surgery. It translated to a reduction in the risk of death by 89%. And you can see the dramatic improvement in the risk of death in those who chose to have bariatric surgery. All right, finally, why would I want to have my surgery performed at the Minnesota Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery at CRMC? Let me tell you why. First of all, we have five uh, accredited faculty level bariatric surgeons who actually teach a fellowship for graduate surgeons who come to our center to learn how to do bariatric surgery. They're very experienced. We don't have any turnover. All of our surgeons have been here, some of us, including me, for well over 30 years. Together, we have performed over 2,200 bariatric surgical procedures with excellent results and a very low complication rate. The other thing that's really important, and which most centers in the, in the entire United States just simply can't match, is the fact that we have a accredited bariatric surgeon on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's not possible in most centers. Why? Because bariatric surgeons are super specialists and the person who's on call sometimes is a basic general surgeon. They really may not be uh, excellent in managing bariatric complications. That can be a problem. Why? Because bariatric complications don't occur in the first day or two after the surgery. We leak test everybody in the operating room. You're not gonna leak then. You're gonna leak if you ever got that complication. 
uh, once you're home. Now fortunately, in a center like ours, leaks are incredibly rare. Uh, if they do occur, however, you need a bariatric surgeon to help you and help you quickly. Therefore, you want to be in a place where you know an accredited bariatric surgeon is available 24-7. MIMIS is that place. So, um, members of the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and Quality Improvement Program, the MBSA Equip, that's very important. What that is, it's a big name, but what that means is that the program here at MIMIS stepped up to the plate many years ago when MBSA Equip was being formed. What that is, is an organization, national organization, that is in the level one centers, that's the highest level of quality. And we said, we want to be measured. We want to look at our outcomes. We want to measure and uh, help us with any deficiencies that we might have so we could correct them. So the MBSA Quip hospitals are the place you want to be. That is some level of reassurance to you that you're in a place where we care about quality. We watch our outcomes and we make adjustments in our program in order to make our outcomes better and better every single year. Finally, the fellowship program. In the state of Minnesota, there's only one accredited bariatric fellowship training program. It's not at the Mayo Clinic, it's not at the University of Minnesota or even Abbott Northwestern. It's here, the Minnesota Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery, Minnesota's only bariatric fellowship training program. Very proud of that. We've uh, finished uh, 14 fellows uh, in our yearly program over the last many years and these young surgeons have gone out into our country, all over the country, and have established other bariatric programs of very high quality similar to ours. In summary, bariatric surgery. It's the most effective and long-lasting treatment for morbid obesity. It reduces the risk of illness associated with obesity. It reduces the risk of death associated with obesity and it helps you feel and look better. Thank you for watching this particular video on bariatric surgery and the causes of obesity. We would welcome you here at the Minnesota Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery. If you're interested in learning more about obesity, please contact our nurse coordinator. And uh, from all of the team here at MEMIS, thank you for watching.